Here I go. I was thinking about Isaac, not the one in the Bible, but years ago I used to work for Bear Stearns. Um, and I learned a lot. Uh, my resume consists of Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs, Liz Claiborne, Dana Buckman, Ralph Lauren, Newark Public Schools, just to name a few. So I've been around a lot of money and wisdom. And so I was speaking today about a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children because that's what the Bible says. So I begin to think about this guy named Isaac. And every day Isaac would come to work at Bear Stearns with his shoes taped up. He would take that silver masking tape, the duct tape, and he would just tape his wingtip shoes. And every day he would put his little newspaper underneath his um, arm and he would say, Good morning, good morning, hey, good morning, hey, good morning, come on. He's like four feet, five, like five feet. He's a little tiny guy. Good morning, good morning, hey, good morning, hey, good morning, 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 morning. And you would hear Isaac way down the hall, morning, morning, morning. But there was a group of guys that always used to laugh at him. And when I tell you they would laugh at Isaac from the time he said good morning to the time he said at his desk. And his desk was a mess. It was coffee, spills everywhere, and, 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 and they would just scratch his head, scratch their head. These guys that was tick, they was teasing Isaac. They were sharp. Daryl. Greg, they were sharp. I mean, they were sharp as a tech. They was like, man, won't you just, won't you, man, Isaac, come on, Isaac, I'm going to get you a pair of shoes. You ain't got to walk around here looking like that. And it didn't bother him. But one day, mm, that man's portfolio came across my desk. Help me, Holy Ghost. In one account, it was 12 million dollars. I didn't say twelve dollars. Me said again twelve million dollars in one account. I remember reading the book The Millionaire Next Door. Most of you have read it. And you really don't know how people live. It's usually the reverse. It's usually people who really got it together that um, really don't have much. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, and we know what happens when you assume, but statistics say that people, or nine times out of ten, people who have really big houses sometimes can't afford them. The key word is sometime. But Isaac's mathematical wisdom was not just numbers. He had discovered one of the greatest stress relievers financially ever, and it was in The Millionaire Next Door. In order to be really wealthy, you have got to get over people's opinions, views, and what they think about you. You have to get over what they believe you should have and how you're supposed to live. You have to get over their perception of what wealth is. You have to get out over all of those things to understand that a wealthy mind starts with what you feel. It's like I was watching that video um, the other week with the young lady that won the she won all this money. She 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 hit the Powerball for two hundred and eighteen million dollars and bailed her boyfriend out of jail. But yet she had a poverty disposition. She had a poverty uh, like mine. Her the way she lived was still impoverished. And so wealth really has nothing to do with money. It has to do with the state of mind first. And once you get the state of mind of wealth, the rest will follow. Meaning, just like Isaac, he could care less what you thought about him. He laughed every day, knowing that even in one account, he had $12 million. I'm not going to even tell you what I saw as I flipped through his portfolio. As I clicked on the buttons, I'm not going to even tell you how much the man's net worth was with tied up wingtip shoes. And so sometimes we really got to get over people in order to be wealthy. We got to get over what they think. Some people need to downsize. I ain't going to front. You need to go somewhere and restructure your entire life and say, y'all may not think I'm supposed to live like this. But if I can have money in the bank and live a stress-free life, 
this don't sound too bad to me. We have to get over what people's view of us is in order for us to really live a life, as God said, fearfully, wonderfully, and abundantly made. We have to get over the cars that we think people think you're supposed to drive. We have to get over the clothes people think. we. It's all what Will Smith said. We knock ourselves out to buy things that we don't need to impress a bunch of people we don't even like. And so real wealth starts in your mind. And then after it follows your mind, it trickles down. And you say, like Isaac, I will wear a, a patched up shoe. Instead of wearing $300 sneakers and $12 in the bank. You know, I have so many conversations during the course of a day of people who are struggling. And the Bible says that he will make us good stewards over our finances. And, and you know, I'm guilty too. But when the light bulb goes off and it's time to get it right, you don't care what folks say. You just want to live a life where you could go. Whew, and look at your bank account and say, I don't even have to touch that this month. The Lord will make you a good steward over your finances. But first, it's got to start with you because you have to be in a mindset to get ready to receive wealth. Or you have to be in a mind frame to get yourself ready to even be faithful over the small things before he gives you the big things. And so I took a page out of Ivan's book years ago. I said, I don't care what people think about me. That's where that's the greatest deliverance where you can not care what people think about you any longer. But Isaac with his taped up shoes, and if you ever read The Millionaire Next Door, you got people who got so much money and they live right in your neighborhood, but you'll never know it. They drive that raggedy car. They live in that little tiny apartment and they have billions of millions of dollars in the bank. Some of them do. And you know what they do? They do what the Bible said. A wise man leaves an inheritance for its children. I'm going to tell you a story and then I'm going to go. My mom, God rest her soul, we lived in Brooklyn. We lived in an area called Clinton Hill. And we lived in a bedroom. We lived at 450 Clinton Avenue. That was our address. And we had a three-bedroom, three-bathroom. It was huge. It was huge. And we paid $132 a month for rent. That's what we paid in Brooklyn back then. But it was something called rent control. And we would say, Mommy, why we got to live here? Sometimes the elevator didn't work. We may see a roach or two. Sometimes, you know... You know, we we um, we would have to take the stairs, but we had everything. My brother had, you know, a nice car and we had nice clothes and we didn't have to want for anything. We always had food and we didn't struggle like that. But we used to say, Mommy, why are we living here? And she would say, shut up. I'm leaving you an inheritance. And we would say, all right, no problem. And then we would walk up the stairs and then we would Mommy, you know, we don't have to. Shut up. I'm leaving you an inheritance. And she used to say that a few times and then she passed away. And do you know when she passed away, she was so smart. Something happened called gentrification, where the area of Clinton Hill was being brought up by um, the very wealthy, if you allow me to say. And they paid a undisclosed amount to my dad for that apartment. And guess what? I understood what she was saying because she left us all a little bit. And while I was looking at the way it looked, she was looking at the inheritance for her children. When I was looking and complaining about things, she was saying, shut up, I'm leaving you an inheritance. And when she passed away, we all understood what she was saying. Because just like Isaac, she didn't look at what it was. She looked at what it was going to do for her future. And so get over what people's opinions of the way you're supposed to live and what you're supposed to drive and what you're supposed to wear. And revamp your whole financial structured life. Get with people who can help you financially make it. Get with you with people who can financially teach you about credit. And God, just help me to be a good steward over my finances. Restructure your entire life. Because we don't have to really struggle. We don't. We just have to get over people's opinions and what they think of us. And you'll be surprised like those millionaire next door. Your stress, your financial hardship will be over if you just get over people. Take a deep breath Whew, and say, you know what? I'm going to restructure my entire life financially. I might be tired for a while, but I'm going to leave an inheritance for my children. Or 
I might be tired for a while and I might not like this car, but I ain't got no car no. Well, I might not like it, but I don't. Cut your hardship down by simply restructuring your life. You might not like what I'm saying, but like I said, every time you click my button, I'm going to tell you something that's going to be true. Sometimes our hardship financially is self-inflicted because instead of putting that money towards a bill, we put it towards bundles of hair. Instead of fixing our credit, we buy J's and I don't know what we do. I mean, I'm guilty of some of that stuff too. When I was younger, I'm older now. Stop the pain. Restructure your life. Move downsize. Whatever you got to do. If you got to take your shoes up like Isaac, but have money in the bank or drive a hoopty, but yet and still you don't have a car note. If it's going to cut your stress level down, do it. I ain't telling you nothing but the truth. And every time you click my button, baby, I'm going to tell you the truth. Bye-bye.